Hi, book club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 116, and our book is Salamander by Nick Kine. This is the first book in the Tome of Fire? Tome of Fire? Salamander's Trilogy. It's not really a trilogy. There's a lot of books in this, in this book. Omnibus. I guess This is we'll probably with. like the most insane omnibus I've owned, because I don't think I've ever had an omnibus with this many short stories packed in with three whole novels. I think eventually that's what they're probably going to end up having to do with Danny Ware's series because the, there's all those short stories. Um, I think we're going to have one of those in the future. But yes, it's a little schizophrenic compared to some of the other ones. Enjoyable, but a little schizophrenic. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via YouTube, Twitter, our site, or, or Encrypted Vox channel. Spoiler warning. If somehow you haven't yet read... It feels weird giving a spoiler warning for a book that's been written this long ago, but here we go. Somehow hey, haven't read this We book. haven't read it. So true that. If you haven't yet read this book, definitely check it out and then listen to this episode as we'll be discussing it from start to finish in great detail. With that, let's dive in. Carrie, did you like this book? I really did. There was some obvious problems with the writing... But the story itself, I loved it. It was... I really didn't like some things. I really... It's... I I think I almost had more of like a studious read on it in so much as I was like, oh, oh, this is where he started. Right? Because we loved Knights of McCrag so much and I loved his Volpone Glory so much. It's, oh, that's right. He it's did always, write Volpone Glory. That's right. It's always kind of interesting to go back and see some of their earlier works and be like, oh, these are your rough edges that you smoothed out. Um, he had a lot of rough edges. He had a lot of rough edges, uh, which we'll talk more about here. I will say, so as I started reading this book, I was like, God, this book's familiar. And then all of a sudden it wasn't. I think I started this book years and years ago and was like, meh, and didn't finish it. So going back, back and reading it again I was definitely more charitable this time like oh, okay no, I'm gonna plow through this because I like his other things so much um you know that's okay solid like I think that in Goodreads it has like a three point something out of five and I would say about three out of five it was a 3.72 I know that because I put in because that was what it was before I put in my review oh all right never accuse us of not being accurate <laughs> And by us, I mean Carrie. Accuracy is not my middle name. What part stood out to you? Um, well, one part really stood out to me that we'll, we'll talk about a lot later because I actually fucking teared up. Um, it was when Nick Helm was murdered. I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, my God. My first thought that when it happened was like he did not play the Game of Thrones well, which then made me giggle. But then I got sad all over again. Um Probably the other thing that really stood out was when Fugus is thinking on this, the blackmail that Iagon pretty much put on him. And he said, did I just make a deal with Horus? I'm like, no, hon, no. You made a deal with Erebus. Ooh. But that's that, what he was. Where he was kept propping up Sugon, it's exactly what Erebus did with Horus, kind of leading him down this way, whether he wanted to or not. Yeah, I think... I think that might be one of the biggest insults that you could give a character in Warhammer 40k. He's but giving I, Erebus. I mean, I but I'm not wrong. Thing. Like, honestly, because when I was first reading it, because I read the short stories before, before I got into it, I was like, it, this seems to me a lot like he's like modeling it after Graham McNeil's Ultramarines. Like, you know, with Sugan and Dakir, with the Learchus and um, Uriel. But then it took a sharp turn I was like, no, he's not doing that at all. Because after um, Kadai was killed, I was like, okay, so Dakir's going to be made captain. And then he wasn't. I'm actually glad he wasn't just because I, I, I think, you know, um, Shugan, the tractor master was very smart and like, yes, he's got potential, but we know this is not a good thing to make. So you make him captain above uh, Kadai's second in command, Nikelm. But so right there, I was like, okay, so it's not, so it's not going to be like that. 
you still got this animosity there. But um, it, then like I say, it took like a much darker turn, which I was like, oh, no, this is this is not the story of Learchus and, and Uriel constantly butting heads. This is the story of Erebus manipulating Horus. I think in this kind of this kind of dovetails um, into I spent all day in a meeting today, a literal eight hour meeting. Can you tell? Um this it, it dovetails nicely into the question about the inner squad dynamics and yeah that was my first thought as well and honestly going back i have no idea why I, did, I didn't keep reading this book but i think that might have been why like going through because originally as i'm reading this i was like oh this is familiar yeah this is kind of like an ultramarines clone mm -hmm. isn't it he read that and was like oh yeah that, that people like that so let's just go ahead and use that again um no no, it definitely takes a, as you said, it takes a ride at Albuquerque. And um, it just, I did, I will say that for the first part of the book, I was not invested in that at all. At all. Every time he would like emphasize the Ignean, um, and it's like, okay, we get it. Um, but you're absolutely right. He did do a good job of taking that as like a diving off point. And then turning it into something different and something that was a little bit more compelling. I think I really struggled with Sugan in general. I thought his. I don't like him. I thought his. Huh? I don't like him. Um, he reminds me of that one guy in Volpone Glory, the one that just kept putting everybody down. Right. Yeah. Similar. Yeah. He. And okay, I, I forget that one of the things that I always like about some of the some of the Space Marine books is that it's very tempting to put to make each of the legions a monolith, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, well, all of the salamanders love humans and are just kind, big, gentle teddy bears. And um, and then like you start reading a book and you're like, oh, this guy's a jerk. They wouldn't allow that in the salamanders. No, of course they would because they're people. Mm hmm. They're, they're human beings, just like anybody else. Um, we've seen it with the Templars, right? Every now and then you get Templars who aren't quite as, um, aren't quite as uh, fanatical as the rest, right? In anything. No, no group is a monolith. And I think that was this look one. At, I think I should Look at Space Wolves and look at Lucas, the trickster, right? Billy doesn't fit in with the Space right. Wolves. Right. Or even I would even say like... It's a lot of them demonstrate like when we read the um the Chris Rate series, some of those guys were not really and I cannot think of the main character's name, right? But after he's been in with the Death Watch, all of a sudden he's like, We're kind of animals, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> and then he kind of comes back into the fold, but not like in the stereotypical way, right? Mm -hmm. So I do like when authors do something different with it. So this is really weird to say. I liked the concept of his character, but I did not like him. I don't think we're supposed um, to, though, either. To be you're totally. not supposed to? No, you're not supposed to. I had to think about that for a second. No, you're not supposed to like him. But I liked I, I think, liked him as a concept. I think you're supposed to pity him a little bit. There's that's I think there's a good yeah, way but, to describe but, him. But not like him. Right. You're not supposed to be like, oh, this guy's kind of awesome. But he does add a complexity to the salamanders that I think it's hard to say is missing because I feel like we just don't get to see the salamanders at <laughs> all, uh, which is sad. Can we talk about that for a second? Why? This is, is my first this... time reading the salamanders, aside from the random short story that I would find in some of the anthologies. Okay. And not counting the Horus Heresy. Exactly. So... Why, though? I don't know. Why? Are, are they like, I guess maybe we get to the, maybe when we get, ooh, I was locked over my teapot. That would have been bad, y'all. You get to the end of this, maybe we'll know why. Are they all just brooding somewhere? Are they on a, the worst scavenger hunt ever? Oh, if I had to go in order, hmm. it's probably the Salamanders, the Iron Hands, and the Raven Guard. But I feel as though... They're kind of always the bridesmaid. 
Like every now and then you read a poor guys that got massacred on Istvan Five. Nobody knows what to do with. Right. Like we've read more White Scars books than we have read. We've read more Karkaridan's books. That's true. And we have read a whole three. I love the Karkaridans. Yeah, I'm, I'm down with them. I absolutely love them. But they are, as you would often say, a washed out successor chapter. So. No, 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 no. Watered down. Get it right. Watered down. Excuse me. I had like <laughs> and they're shark words. people, so they're really watered down. <gasps> but um, I know. Um, <laughs> come for the books, stay for the jokes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, like we've read more books about a watered down successor chapter than we have about a founding chapter. I cannot tell you how many Ultramarines books there are. Imperial Fists, uh, the Space Wolves, the. Dark Angels. I'm trying to think of Raven Guard. Like, we haven't really read a proper Raven Guard book. We've read books with Raven Guard in them. I'm That's thinking. why I say they're, all, they're kind of always the bridesmaid. Like, an Iron Hand will get mentioned. Raven kind Guard of. Will, be along, will be along for the ride. They are, um, Iron Hands are just forgotten. Like, David Geimer actually wrote an Iron Hands book probably out a few years ago, which I do have on my shelf and I haven't read it yet. But they're totally, you know... Ferris Manus loses his head. So everyone's like the Iron Who Warriors. You know, and it's kind of funny because I do feel like sometimes when I think about the chapters, like I, uh, I kind of forget the Iron Hands exist. Like their most, I, I think I saw this. It was a meme once. I think actually you and I have it when they talked about how like their biggest claim to fame, their Primarch was the first to die. Like, and we didn't read those Iron Hands books for this podcast, right? But you have read them. So that's why I say, like, maybe they're the second. The Raven Guard always seemed to show up as the clinger on, right? Like, oh, no, I haven't like, read the Iron Hands talk. books. I own it. I have not sat down and, and read it. And I want to because it's, it's David Geimer wrote it, and I love his writing. Well, and also, as we're having to delve into the Wayback Machine, there's another idea. Mm. Um, but... We need more Raven Guard. I have a Raven Guard tattoo for fuck's sake. Um, I love my Raven Guard. Um, my Broody Boys, which is why I was so excited in the Vulcan Shield story. I was like, oh, Raven Guard. And, you know, then that was over really quickly. Uh, <laughs> you know. Um, but the Salamanders, I, I'm trying to figure out why them in particular. Like, Because if you think about it, on paper, the Iron Hands, what have we always said about the Iron Hands? And then the Diet Mechanicus, mm-hmm. right? Yay, Joy. Um, the Space Marine Mechanicus, who, I don't know, we already read enough stuff about tech marines and, yeah, whatever. Right. Um, the Raven Guard, one of the common things that I've seen people talk about with the Raven Guard is that the Night Lords are kind of more interesting, right? Because they're a little grumpier. And I do think that some people, whenever I read short stories with the Raven Guard, people do tend to lean into the broody emo aspect of them, which... And I'll be really honest, Gav Thorpe kind of almost killed them for me in the Horus Heresy. The Salamander, so. Like, first off, Salamander, that's an awesome name and an awesome loco. Second off, you come from a volcano planet. And third, like, you're known for fire. Th- fourth, and more importantly, did you read the descriptions of these people? They sound amazing. Like, burning coal eyes. And that humanistic element about them makes them... Which is so funny intriguing. that they made them look so scary, but yet they're the most compassionate. Like, yeah, that's not subtle, but that's still kind of funny at the same time. They deal with that in that Warhammer Plus story. I think it's Pariah Nexus. When he takes his helmet off in front of those children and they're all scared and he's just like, no, 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 don't worry, don't worry. This is just this is a gift from my father, basically. And you're like... Um, they're an interesting legion, and we'll talk more about this in a second. But the fact that their Primarch may or may not still be alive somewhere, Vulcan lives. Hashtag. Um, I don't, I can't figure out why they are so underutilized. Not that we're going to solve this tonight, but why are they so underutilized? Well, I've been wondering that like, for they a even, while. I don't even think they show up. Like the Raven Guard, I feel like we've read lots of books where it's like, oh, and then all of a sudden this Raven Guard shows up. And you're like, whoa, Raven Guard, cool, awesome. And then he's gone or does something cool and then he leaves. Um, like kills a couple trying to just trying to trying to get laid. 
<laughs> ultimate buzz kills but in the iron hands too right but i feel like the salamanders hmm, yeah it's just weird to me um so i guess i'm glad that nick kime write him i wrote the, i wish this book was of better quality well i mean like we said this is one of his first books it was written back in 2009 so which feels like forever ago it's like oh yes one of the ancient tomes well <laughs> well I mean, to be fair, we keep forgetting 2020 lasted seven years. So that's why it feels like it's so, so long. 2020 was four years ago. I know, but 2020 lasted seven how? years. So no, I know, but how? How was it four years ago? Like on one hand, it feels like it was 10 years ago. And on the other, it feels like it was last year. It's true. It does. Time but, means nothing anymore. <laughs> no, time time does need, mean nothing. But but yeah, but, but yeah, it's one of his first books. It's It's rough. Um, did you like seeing them though did you think that this was a good first step for a new like i don't know how well, to say yes, this not sounding I, weird yeah i mean I, I do like salamanders because like i said like the only thing i ever knew about them is from the horus heresy and um they're kind of a little mopey right now which okay i understand right. their primarch is dead join dead. the club and uh or they think he's dead because only uh, three of them saw him rise out of the desert. Um, but, and I just, I've only just started the current, the, what is it called? Oh, Old Earth, which is about Vulcan return. And he's basically told his sons, like, don't tell anybody I'm still alive. Like, all right, that's weird, but okay, we're just, we're just going to move on from that. That's the only thing I've ever, I've ever read about them. Like, and again, like I said, the occasional short story. So I was glad to be able to read. I've been wondering where the salamanders have been all this time. I even like asked Nick Kime on Twitter and said, what the F are the salamanders up to? And his response was, oh, they're out there doing things like, OK, have we forgotten about the salamanders? We've forgotten about Lazarus. Sorry, Vulcan. Lazarus. Yes. Yes. Lazarus. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of half wondering. Like today, and I was driving around, I was like, you know what? It kind of feels to me like it's not fair that the traitor Marines, you know, aside from the two that have been killed, like outright killed, killed, they're all still alive. Like, we know where they are. We know what they're doing, sort of. Pouting in a room somewhere. Well, it's like, well, you know, we know Mortar Most of them. Mortarium was sent to his room. Um, Fulgrim is... I don't know what he, he's there. partying in his room. He's at the all night rave or he's still like reenacting his, uh, um, uh, the chemos. If we're going to, you know, if we're going to say that Josh Reynolds, what he wrote was, uh, his canon. It, if I had to scrap, like, l let's pretend if I had to choose just one element from the Reynolds file books to keep as canon and keep in mind, clone Grimm comes from him. Um, the one element, if I had to get rid of everything else that I would keep, would be that. Oh, Fulgrim reenacting Chemos. I actually so, think that's somewhat delightful. So we, we know what he's doing. Um, Perturabo, we just, we saw in the re, the republishing of, uh, was it, what is that book? It's your favorite, and it's your favorite book, Storm of Iron, that he had a nice conversation with Hanso. So well, he, that's, that is added. That was added to the special edition because that sure shit didn't happen in the original one. Well, that's what I just said. I said in the reprint. I and had to then, remind. I had to reiterate okay, that. Okay, okay. Uh, we know Lorgar is off somewhere pouting. Well, Erebus and Corferon are just doing whatever the hell they want. We know for. Angron is out there. Angry. Yes. Yeah, so that that's all of them, right? I name all of them? Malfarious and Omegan. Oh, well, we have no idea what. <laughs> question mark, question mark, yeah, question, question mark, question mark. I mean, I, I have officially read the book where Dorn killed Alfarius and they talk about how Megan, like, he feels stricken because he's missing a half of himself. So I'm like, okay, so Alfarius really is dead? Question mark. <laughs> yeah, like, is he? I don't I don't even know. Maybe they don't even know. Like, yeah, they've maybe. gotten so wrapped up in their bullshit. They're like... <laughs> It was he I don't God, what if I'm Malfarious? So like uh, Omegan when he uh he had to talk to Horus, he's like, Yes, I'm Malfarious. Because now he's like the official new Alfarius, like who knows? 
So you got all those. It's not really that fair, is it? That they're all still around. And then, like, you know, we guess we got Gulliman out of sleep. We guess, guess we have the lion out of sleep, maybe. Okay. No idea where Jagatai is. No idea where Lehman Russ is. No idea what happened to Dorn, except that he's not missing a hand. And Vulcan. Like, this is kind of not that fair, guys. So, so let's talk a little bit about Vulcan. Because it kind of permeates the salamanders, right? Like, everybody has this, to your point on this, right, is that everybody has this sort of tale of when their dads are coming back, right? Um, like, everybody knows, the space wolves all know, dad's coming home when the wolf time, right? He's coming home when this is done, right? Certain people within the the Dark Angels knew he sleeps. Um the the white scars he's somewhere somewhere in the webway hunting eldari like he's somewhere in the webway doing some stuff right like everybody kind of has an idea of where their primark are is or there's some sort of myth about when he'll return right corax um there's this in vulcan's thing it's a little bit more nebulous right oh he'll return if we find all of the magical macguffins if we go on the magical scavenger hunt he'll return um is it i don't this know what i'm trying to say mean for yeah us. do you it seems like for a guy who was super nice and super cool the fact that it's like i'll come back after you find all of my stuff after Weird you flex but okay after you interpret all the clues if you interpret the clues and you come to this place he's just gonna be like in a room somewhere talking with lorgar <laughs> They hugged it out. They hugged it out. <laughs> the guy who didn't even like Conrad Kurz. Like, he liked everybody. And he didn't like Kurz. Um, is it... I don't know how to say it. Is it compelling? Do you like this about them? Is it an interesting layer about the salamanders? So I do have a question about salamander lore. Maybe you can answer it. Maybe not. So this whole idea of the scavenger hunt from Vulcan, was that established in the Horus Heresy? Did Nick Kaim establish it? Or is that just part of their lore? Oh, gosh. You know what? I actually don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. <clears throat> Paging Skywatcher Adept. Um, I don't actually know where that was. I know it's a thing. I don't know. I don't even know where I learned that now. Um, was it established in the Horus Heresy? I don't think so. You're further in that than I am now. I gave up long before you did, so... Is that not even canon? Is that just a fan theory? Oh... Y'all, I'm freaking out. Because, like, I'm, cause I don't know if he shows up in Siege of Terra or not. Um, and then what happens after that? I think so. My husband's reading The End and the Be Death Part 17 right now. And I think that, I think it's mentioned that he's in there. I think he said that. It was, like, the well, one high point <laughs> the one of, high that, <laughs> of that, like, 6,000 page Hey, it's actually not as fat as the second one, so. It's true, but combined, congratulations, you outwrote it. And they unabridged the stand. Um, yeah. So, anyways, um, it, does it add an interesting layer to the salamanders? Do you like that about them? Like, again, I, I think this all goes back to uh, this whole, what do we know about them? Like, uh, so us personally one thing within this I'm, podcast not liking about that i uh, liking about the idea of this scavenger hunt and, you know it kind of goes i'm going to jump ahead to one of your questions whereas like um uh crap was this an appropriate use of the salamanders because this feels almost dark angel-y really hoping you were going to say that because <laughs> that was kind of because that's kind of what i was thinking when they were going you know it was one thing when they were going to uh, they were going after uh the, the dragon warriors to see what, ha what right. happened with them that made 100 percent sense absolutely what did you think of that by the way think of what i think i'm going after the dragon warriors i mean it made sense it was you know nick helm's he thought this was the only way that they could, you know, bring together the fractured company. It, it made it made sense. Was it a waste of resources? Probably, but I understood why why he was doing it. Um, 
But then when they find that artifact and it's suddenly just like, you know, record scratch across the entire chapter and they all like stock down with whatever they're doing. I don't know what other campaigns they have out there. What? But it's like, no, now we are doing this. And so even if the third company needed to do a campaign, no, they're doing this now. So I'm not sure exactly how I feel about that, because like I said, that feels it felt even when it happened, I was like, is there there might be something else going on right now, you guys like. This feels like something the Dark Angels would do like, oh, we're on this mission. Oh, crap. Did you see the fallen? Like, so we're leaving now to go after what we think might be a fallen. Yes. And I think this also it also tags into one of the things that I've mused about before with the Space Marines is that they're oddly materialistic. <laughs> like they like their stuff. No one likes their stuff like the way the Blood Angels like their stuff. Okay, literally nobody. <laughs> like yeah, even literally the, nobody. Even the flesh terrors stuff. are like dudes. <laughs> you have too much stuff. What if that was like Marie Kondo would have a heyday? <laughs> the blood. No, they, no, she would not because everything inspires joy. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, that's true. That's true. It all br- does this bring joy? Yes, <laughs> just like the other seventeen. Um, I, uh. yeah, I, I. What, what if that was like the core division between the flesh terrors and the blood angels? And they were like, oh, I just don't care about stuff. Ooh, like. The chalice does not inspire joy. No, not really. I mean, hey, Dante you tried. To go. Dante tried to give Seth, you know, an artifact. He's like, I don't want that. <laughs> like, what do you mean you don't want that? Dante's like, <laughs> I give you the thing, the stuff. But, but I'm giving this to you. You have to take it. <laughs> there, um, what was Carl Urban's name in Ragnarok? Oh my behold, God! Behold my, my stuff. stuff. <laughs> there that's the under is it um they're all the materialistic but yeah no i've it, it did it was a uh, as as the kids would say they're in their dark angels era because it just yeah they're just like oh stop record as you said it was a record scratch moment of and off we go because now this is more important this is more pressing really like is this gonna save lives oh no probably not I mean, but like, kind is this of, helping? Like, what is this doing to help the Imperium? I mean, mm-hmm. it kind of did. They did get all those people off of off of Scoria, and they stopped an orc infestation. <laughs> yeah, but they didn't know that. Well, they didn't go there knowing. Now, see, now you I sound think... like Sugan. Um, if anyone's ever seen Phineas and Ferb, it's one of my absolute favorite episodes. But you didn't know that. Um. The, and that's, I think, again, this goes back to being a monolith, is that when I think of, I think it's mostly because of me, when I think of the salamanders, I think the Eldari, I think helping people from chaos, right? Like really focus on the people here. So seeing them come up against the orcs, oh, okay, that's an interesting choice, I guess, but okay, um, it, it, again, because we don't see them so much, I think I have this very prescribed notion of what the salamander, and this is nobody's fault but my own, um, I have this very prescribed notion of what the salamanders do and don't do. So seeing them up against orcs, well, I guess this will work. Um, we just saw, we just saw a book recently. Oh, hell. I don't remember who it was, but somebody was up against the Tau and we were like, really? The Tau? And it actually worked out really well. Um, I can't think of fuck it was. It was something from last year. And when I say that, it was probably something from 2022. <laughs> Again, what is time? Um, because in my mind, we read Apocalypse last year. In Shroud of Night as well. Like the last Tao book I remember is uh, Long Shot. No, it wasn't that one. It'll come to me. But anyways, my point being, I was I was a little like, oh, is that the best use of their time? First, honest calendar hunt. And second off, orcs? It worked. It was fine. It was fine. Um But I think I think for their first book, I think I wanted something a little less run of the mill bolter porn. Although 
Yeah, we'll get there in a second. Um, ah, but the, see, <laughs> now to me there. that's not exactly fair because I think most of these guys' first books with this is bolter porn. I mean, look at um, you know, ADB's first book, Katie and Blood. That's bolter porn. First Ultramarine's book. That was bolter porn. I'll dive more into that in a second. Um, but yeah, you're probably right. There is something with the first book where I think, and you can kind of feel this, well, this is actually bridging into that next question about this being his first book. And really what you can see is that I think there's this tendency to play it safe, right? Like don't, yep. don't do anything too complicated. Don't really color outside of the lines too much. Um, just keep it simple, right? Get in, get out. Here's a story and here's a lot of boulder porn. I will say that, and he's, I was trying to think about this. I think Knights of Crag is probably the best example of this. He is not the strongest battle writer. And you mm. see that in this book, especially. Well, yes. Like, you, you I can't, can't even but... call it bolter porn. No, but I think of Knights of Crag though, and I think of the amazing scene of um, he, Kato Sicarius, like sand surfing down the orc mech all right so like that to me is like probably one of the best battles nick 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 kind of wrote to be totally honest although i think he did, he did pretty good in volt and glory as well he got better he's grown into mm -hmm. it he's definitely again you can see some of those rough edges that he smoothed out in some of the places where he really grew and flourished um this one that was the only thing is like for a space marine book it's a little disappointing on the boulder porn not gonna lie hmm. where i think you could almost argue that looking at that first um why can i not think of the first ultramarines book name Night oh um nightbringer or something like that yeah Night it was like under night sky like no no because dead dead sky black sun is the third yeah. one when they're on yeah, it's like I think it's Nightbringer it's just, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you're right. It's just Nightbringer. I just turned around and looked. It's Nightbringer. It's something like that. No, I just uh, turned around and looked. It's Nightbringer. Sometimes my memory's not complete crap. Um that's one where I think you can almost argue it's a little too heavy into the Boulder mm -hmm. porn, right? Especially compared to some of his later novels, because that's what he knew and what he wrote really well. Um I think I also kind of wanted to see the Salamanders kick some more ass. I guess is what I'm saying. I wanted more I was looking for good Boulder porn. Mm. and this was just this was okay i think which that's why i also i kind of give it like a meh, okay um well talk, i mean let's this talk was, about this let's talk kind, more about Zugan. this is kind of the wrong company though for some really good bolter porn because they all had issues talk about some of those issues shall we What's they had daddy favorite? issues and i don't mean so, vulcan so many of the legions daddy issues but theirs was a particular brand yeah theirs was their captain how he was killed did you know that he was killed no he was killed sorry it wasn't that it wasn't that obnoxious but yeah they definitely had this and i get it i get it like obviously you're gonna you're gonna really respect your captain and blah 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 but it did feel a little much but I think that's because nobody had much faith in Nick Helm, um, probably because he was always like a second in command, right? And then when you have the chaplain and the apothecary who are sulking because they miss the, their best friend so much, that's not helping matters. Like Nick Helm feels like he has nobody. He asks Dakir to become the new champion and Dakir's like, oh God, no, don't do that, which was actually very smart of him. It would have been very, very bad if he became... A champion that would just would have fueled Sugan even further into uh, his little uh, conspiracies. Uh, but but I think it was just like you know the way he died. Uh, the and way this he is died. this is one of these few novels I have to say that short story, uh, the fires of war, is like mandatory reading for this. You have to have read that to understand what they're referring to with this. Who the Dragon Warriors even are. Because they didn't even get into that. They're just like... Actually, they're looking... so you have two things there that I kind of I want to unpack. Mm -hmm. Let's remove, like, you know, we'll put a pin in that and unpack 
this. We're not in your meeting anymore. Uh, so I appreciate where you're coming from, but I am going to push back on you a little bit. Oh, my God. And <laughs> been a day, you guys. Um, so, but you do have a couple of things there that I would like to dive further in. Yeah. One is the idea of them. They were very sulky about the loss of their captain. And OK, so here's my thought that I've been wrestling with on this particular item. The salamanders are renowned as being one of the more humanistic of the space marines, right? They're very much in touch with their human side and humanity and blah, blah, blah. Is that then why they demonstrated some emotions that I would say, like, we haven't really seen. We've seen a sulky space marine here and there, but to have them like a, gr a large group of them, are they feeding off each other? Is it because they're more humanistic that they're like, hey... We got emotions. We got feelings. We actually process our feelings I, on like some other chapters. So I did wonder um, that as well. It's like, cause they keep talking about their compassion. Like, well, then that would make sense if they have this compassion and they just feel so much that they would be having a harder time dealing with this, especially with the captain that everybody liked, literally everybody liked him. Right. So is that the, is that why? Or, because it did feel, felt a little non-Space marine to me. Like, that was one of the things that I kept struggling with, as I was like, really? Y'all this petulant and childish? At the same time, a lot of them act like this in the Horus Heresy. To be fair. Well, and that was another thing, right? Because <laughs> in the Horus Heresy. <laughs> Typhon. In the Horus Heresy, they're also, like, we know already that they were a little bit more in touch with their human side, right? They were a little less more, less murder bot. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm saying they're murder bots, but you know what I mean. Like they were less uh, removed from that side of them. So these guys did almost feel Horus Heresy esque. Um, it was weird, and I don't know how I felt about any of that. I think that was another thing that I was like, "This is unbecoming." Um, but again, maybe like the more I digest this and the more I chew on this, maybe that's just the price they pay for it being like, "Nope, we are very much in tune with that side of us. We have that compassion." We have that emotional maturity. More business speak. Or, you know, because one that they, they mentioned in here is like how they're still feeling the reeling from Istvan 5, of all things, that was over 10,000 years ago. And just that the betrayal, it's like they can, they still feel that betrayal. And even though they talk about how that they're not sure what's myth and what's real, but they know that betrayal was real and they talk about how they feel like the chapter never recovered its numbers properly after that and how they're not even a thousand strong they're still below right. quota um or what their max can be so i wonder if low quota now who's in a meeting <laughs> their numbers for q1 are very weak <laughs> we need to talk about market shares <laughs> we want to see that hockey stick growth oh, god Anyway, <laughs> so I was so I wonder if that's part of it too. Just like a big like you know they just have like all these things. They have all these things and they actually deal with their feelings, unlike everybody else. Although the blood angels feel a lot too, but then they get all murdery. <laughs> we don't want the blood angels having feels. No, because no, that's usually no, when the red thirst bad. and the black rage happens. Yeah, their feels are bad feels. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen, yeah, I, I think maybe that, you know, I think I'm talking myself into that, that that's what that is, is just having that more, that in touch with your feelings. And yeah, they display this. Now, I do think that that kind of spoke poorly that they couldn't, you know, okay, guys, <laughs> let's snap out of it now. Um at some point, well, you have to be able to be like, okay, stop pouting, please. But I think they were trying, but then you had Sugan that kept poking at that wound because Aegon was, or Yagan, however, I don't know how you want to pronounce it, kept poking at it. All I could think of the whole time was that parrot from Aladdin because it's spelled nearly Iago. the same way. Yeah, Iago. Like, yep, yeah, you're just like mm -hmm. that. You're just as annoying. Now you had, well, now he has Gilbert Gottfried's voice. That's just official. Obviously. 
Pretty much. Yeah. Yago, that's actually quite lovely if you make that canon in your head. Um, there's no audiobook version, so it could be. Mm -hmm. Hey, Which if there is, is one. AI generator. If there is one. You guys, you need to make him sound like Gilbert Godfrey to be amazing. I bet you there's an AI generator that would do that. Some sort of deep fake. Um. <laughs> That would actually be kind of awesome. If yeah, have because we don't have enough reading. problem with deep fakes in the world. But anyway, I digress. These would be fun deep fakes, though. And all I can say is just hear me out for one second. Gilbert Gottfried. Erebus. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like every character just oh increases God. their market value by having <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried as their voice. Tell me I'm wrong. So oh. one thing. One thing that I want to address really quickly here that you kind of mentioned, because this also makes this somewhat unique, is that I feel like a lot of the books that we've read, um, there's always short story collections that go along with them, right? Um, the short stories typically tend to be more flavor text mm -hmm. than anything where it's just like, oh, are you curious about the captain who died and gave Uriel Ventress his sword? You want to know more about that? There's a short story for that, actually. You can go and read that. Like, it tends to be more supplemental. Mm -hmm. This uh, this definitely felt like it was a must-have. Like, yep. his short stories, it was pretty much just a continuation of the story. Oh, I'll point to the Danny Ware ones. If you hadn't read all the Danny Ware stories, you wouldn't have been completely lost just picking up the story about the Order of the Bloodied Rose. They just add a little bit more flavor. I'm like, oh, hey, cool. She's really awesome. This book definitely felt like, I mean, you've read the, you did the six-week correspondence course, right? six weeks but you know what i mean i I'm thought that curious. was a unique and interesting choice maybe an editorial choice but I, I wonder some of that is to do with his you know newness and, and writing right it could be because it, i read his introduction and he talked about how when he submitted that short story of the fires of war it got so well received they came to him to continue the story um, and you know, the problem I always have, like when I'm reading series, especially if I have everything back to back to back, and I was like, oh my God, are we retelling this again? Like, like, yes, Batman's parents were killed. Okay. Oh my God. You know, Ben Parker was killed after he told, you know, Peter, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. We get it. All right. But, but did you really get it? But when a book comes, you know, years later, they do kind of recap things a little bit. He didn't do that really here. Things got mentioned and it kind of assumed that, well, you're reading this book because you read my short story in White Dwarf, right? And you really liked it. So therefore, that's, that's why you picked up this book, which could be fair. But at the same time, it's like it's a little... It, it, to me, it speaks of um, amateur, just like being an amateur novelist and not kind of doing a nice little recap. Some there's There are ways you can do it without, you know, it being that, did you know that Batman witnessed his parents getting killed in a dark alley? Okay, so now you've taught you, sorry, I'm trying, I'm trying to resist this because you've, you've, you, you found one of my trap cards here. <laughs> um, no, it's it's one of those things that I think is always interesting to me, and this this goes across multiple multiple of the Space Marine chapters. So I'm not saying that the Salamanders are unique in this, but you're you're not wrong. One of the things that I don't like about Batman and what I don't like about Spider Man is that that's the defining moment of their life. These men were both twelve or sixteen, and then they were whatever age they are now, and nothing in between happened. So the sole defining moment of their lives was this. Now. I can understand because the Primarch is something that's a little bit special. It was a demigod and that's kind of a big thing, right? I get it. However, it has been 10,000 years. So while well, you should obviously still like, hey, yeah, don't forget that <laughs> these assholes killed half of us. Uh, they do feel oddly fixated and oddly obsessed with that. And it does feel like their soul defining quality. Maybe hey, our this... dad might still be alive. That's our soul defining feature. About like what, what motivates and drives us as people and as characters. That's what it's the fact that our dad might still be alive and that we're also we were betrayed on Istvan. Something else happened to you guys in this many years. 
I mean, that's... So I'm kind of being a hater right now. I admit this. Yeah, I mean, I guess. It could, to me, what I've... Because it gets brought up a lot, their defining characteristic is their pragmatism. Seriously, mm-hmm. Mr. Kime, I could have made a drinking game out of this. Anytime they... Which is funny, because what was my number one complaint about this book? He needed to have the... the, 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 the uh, I can't talk tonight. The thesaurus taken away from him. Because <laughs> the number of, not even $5 words, straight up $10 words... He was using that I was like, really? Really? That was the word we decided to go with? And then he used pragmatism like 6,000 times. <laughs> you needed the thesaurus here and not here. The, their defined characteristics was the pragmatism. Did you get that? That they're pragmatic? Because they are. I wasn't really sure if they were pragmatic, though. And, I wasn't picking up on that. And their compassion to wanting to protect people. Yes, so you their have, compassion like, for sure. So they have. they kept mentioning that. Over and over again, this is their defining characteristic. Basil is like, yes, Janice, I get it by now. I get it. It's cool. And then it's like, but they were so sad because of this. Like, okay, we just, we took it to a whole different level. <laughs> yeah. But no, I, 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 under, I understand what you're saying. I don't think it was that prominent, though. Except for like, yes, there's a scavenger hunt, but I blame Vulcan for that. I just mean in general, maybe not in this book as much, but yeah, it's one of those things that I'm like, guys, <laughs> there's been a few things that happened in the interim. Um, like, I will actually point to the Space Wolves, like how many grudges do those guys have, have because of XYZ battle, right? Like they're not continually going back to that. Um, and the Ultramarines are a really good example too, how much they were always waiting for Bob to wake up. and But it was always kind of like, a, oh man. Dad's going to wake up someday. Anyways, moving on. Um, like, it's it's little things like that that drives me crazy. And you were absolutely, you were correct. It did, it, it, it did have that Wayne's vibe. Hmm. But yes, that's my, that's my take on that one. Um, and it could just be because I wasn't like super thrilled with this that I was like, Burr. I'm always willing to admit this. The $52,000 question though. Hmm. Are you excited for the next book? Like, yes. Are, are you, you're grabbed into the series? Oh, yes. And all of the short stories, and like the supplemental reading material. Like, I was hoping you loved this book as much as I did, because so therefore you'd be like, well, let's go ahead and read the next one. Because like. Oh, so like I was at the Night Lords. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was like, just love. Wait, what do you mean you didn't love it? Oh, fuck. <laughs> so, I mean, so we, we have our things just because like, I am very invested in it. I need justice for Nikel, man. Justice. Okay. I need Iagon dead. I, will I need get his you that. family dead. I need his dog dead. We're going, we're going after them with chains and bottles. No, I, I feel that. Even though I wasn't like super involved or super invested in... Even though I wasn't super invested in his... For some reason, my family, like the Three Wing Circus in here... Um, the, I wasn't as invested in the characters and stuff, but I was upset about the death. That was the one. I it reminded me of um, War of Secrets. Mm. As you said, he did not play the Game of Thrones very well, and that was a real bummer. You know, the crazy thing is that, that scene sad. when Nickel's death also reminded me of if anyone's seen Sons of Anarchy. There is a scene, it's the second to last season. God, I don't remember the character's name. Oh, his best friend. No, 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 no. This is the wife. Oh, oh, yeah. I don't remember her name. But there's a scene where she she actually makes a negotiation with Jax to be a mother. And he's agreed he's going to take the fall. Which makes sense. Kind of should. He's been a criminal. And there's a scene, Tara, Tara, that's her name. Tara. She walks into her house and she just kind of smiles. It's like, she's at peace. And then around the corner, here comes Gemma, who attacks her, throws her head in a stink and starts stabbing her with a meat fork. It's an awful, awful scene. But that reminded me of that scene as well. Because there's Nikeln looking around Everyone's chanting his name. He's like, oh my gosh, I have earned this. I do deserve being captain. This is amazing. 
And then, bam, you have Gemma, a.k.a. Yagon, coming in and stabbing him in the side. He, he probably had a meat fork, too, actually. Seems like a guy who would kill someone with a meat fork, but, but yeah. You picture Gilbert Gottfried stabbing someone with a meat fork. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, would you picture Katie Seagal doing it? But she did. So Yeah. Her character in that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that was actually when I stopped watching that show. <laughs> it was like, and I'm out. Um... I made it that far though. I thought you. Um, I thought she left after uh, the best friend got killed. And after thought... Opie got killed. Yeah, my husband left mm. after Opie got killed. Um, ha! I remember the character name. Look mm. at me go. Um. All right. Well, anyway, not that. Not that that matters. But that's kind of kind what of. it all reminded me of. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Which um, is funny because this book came before Sam that that season in Sons of Anarchy. So. Hmm. Is that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. For some reason in my head, Sons of Anarchy is like, like, for some reason in my head, Sons of Anarchy was contemporary with like Oz and The Wire. Oh. No. It was a little after The It was after The Wire. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so... Again, it had good moments in it. I'm excited to read the next the next books. You could see that. I mean, again, that one comes out in 2009. I'm, I'm again from a clinical, studious perspective. I'm excited to see how he grows as an author and how this continues. I want more books about the salamanders. So yeah, even though I wasn't super crazy about this one, I'm gonna keep reading it because salamanders and because we need to dig well, into the wayback machine. And my best friend loved it, so we have to keep going on with it because so, solidarity, brothers. You know, there's a question you didn't put in here. Huh. Were you surprised about Dakir? We haven't even mentioned Dakir very much. We ha What does that say? Anyways, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Um kind of Were you? No. <sighs> yeah, I, I don't I had a feeling he was like he's a latent psyker. I just I had this feeling from he was the, giving vibes from one of that sh one of the short stories, and then um, what it really hit me is when um, they were with the Marines Malevolent, which they're a fun group, and Periel spoke in one of their heads because the guys they're like mm. I love how they're like well we actually honor the Council of Nikea, Sugan's best line, you're honoring outdated edicts. From a council that existed before you were even created. <laughs> it's like, eh, you need some ointment for that burn. Um, you know, he was going to, he was, he was about to kill Periel. And Periel spoke to him. Who's like, don't even try it. You'll be dead before you can pick it up. Yeah. And Dakir hears it. Yes. I was like, okay, he's a latent psyker. Well, and there's also that scene very early on where he's kind of musing in his head. Imperial pops in and is just like, yeah, now we're all feeling that. And he's just like, oh, man, okay, yeah. It, he's just picking up my surface thoughts. Was he, though? Was he just picking up your surface thoughts or are you extra loud? Yep, kind of so, projecting. I think I think my big question was, I wasn't really surprised about it. I mean, yeah, kind of. But my, I think my real question was, Why? Like, he's going to obviously hold train to be a librarian, and that's super exciting because don't we all need more librarians in our lives? And um, apparently he's in part of a prophecy as well. Maybe he's the key to Vulcan's return. Which that was a little weak. I'm sorry. Like, I was cool with him going off and being, I was cool with him going off and being a librarian. Like, that totally makes sense. Like, I'm sad he's longer going to, you know, be sergeant of the squad. I was happy that Bakken got their promotion. I was even happier that Sugon left. Uh, I was like, yeah, now that that, that can heal. <laughs> now the healing can begin. Until um, Yagan exacts his revenge. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, my friend. Um, I think it's it's an interesting choice because it does kind of almost feel like the, the prophecy thing, I just can't. I am not a chosen one. Fan. I know. Uh, I do not like messiah figures. When that I happened, like I was like, and this is where Jen hates the book. <laughs> Pretty much. I am not a prophecy fan. I just am not. Um, 
<laughs> unless it rhymes. And I don't know. But I think my first thought was this guy. This is our chosen one. Um, I, I, Again, I like the idea. It's always interesting to me when the... <laughs> here's another fun thing. Late stage psychic <laughs> manifestation, right? Without... Because now we're seeing that a lot now because of the rift. This is pre-rift. Late stage psychic manifestation. So he was like... He had that before it was trendy. Now you say Nick Kimes trendsetter. I mean, he set the stage for Sons of Anarchy. He just <laughs> he did he did a latent cycle. He was reading, he... going, "Oh shit, we got to do this." <laughs> I did like his two subtle crow references in there. By the way, mm. those are fun. Um, I can't read all the time, and of course, calling it Hell Knight. Um, well, don't you just love? The uh, Dante's Inferno reference as well. I have a feeling that those are only going to increase. And that's, again, I think, you know what? Okay, as we're talking through this, I think I have given, I think I've summed up my complaints with the book. It wasn't bolter porny enough. It's definitely, and it's leaning into this prophecy. You already have the prophecy that dad's going to return, and then you have the sky. It just kind of felt, it felt... Like, it was trying to play it safe, but also, like, be grandiose at the same time. Heavy-handed is how I would kind of kind of put it. But it. It wanted to have its cake and eat it, too. Again, I think that's a symptom of being a new writer. So I think you're absolutely right. So I'm really curious to see how this, you know, expands. But I guess I'm going to have to yeah. wait. That's right, because we got Yarrick up next. We got Yark. And we and promised then... this time we are actually going to read <laughs> Imperial Creed. Blame the Games Workshop and their shipping schedule, people. Yes, my uh, my copy of The Omnibus is coming, uh, allegedly. Uh, it'll be here this week. So I, yeah, my copies of the Yarrick books, these individual books, are in boxes somewhere in the basement. And ain't nobody got time for that. And everybody likes an omnibus. It has short stories and stuff mm -hmm. in it. They're just more better. So as we continue to dive into the Wayback Machine, I do know, I did notice that somebody also suggested Baneblade by Guy Haley. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to put that I was, looking, I was looking at that. Mm -hmm. Seems interesting. We'll have to put, yep. I'm 99% certain that my husband read that one. Um, we'll have to read that one coming up as we're going into the Wayback Machine. So keep your uh, suggestions coming. But we did learn our mistakes from the Fabulous Bill series. We shall not be ODing on them. So we're going to probably leapfrog through these three way back series as we go through. I'm kind of excited. Uh, it's a nice blend of chaos humans and humanistic space marines who yes. are pragmatic. Yes, the pragmatic space. The pragmatic yet compassionate. But also somewhat petty and mopey. And yet he <laughs> kept talking about how that they... they we're big isolationists. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. How are you going to be compassionate and yet you have to be isolationist? Like, I don't, I don't get it. The math ain't happen. <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Why don't you just say the chaplain is a jerk and move on? <laughs> like, <laughs> pretty much. Do you want to take us out, Carrie? I suppose I will. Because I don't have anything set up here. Because, I don't know. I'm sorry, people. I suck today. It happens. So what happens when I don't start reading the book until Friday. <laughs> we have had, a, we both have had a, a week. It's been something, I'll say that. So you've listened to the Warhammer 40k book club episode regarding Salamander by Nick Kime. Be sure to join us next time for Imperial Creed. I promise. For realsies this time. Uh, so we are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those wonderful things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast, literally anywhere you get podcasts. And come join our Discord. We actually have fun discussions going on there. And a lot of people actually show what they're painting and... And I'm like, I'm not one of them, but I appreciate all of the art. I love those. And please keep that coming because yeah. I, I will paint vicariously through you. Exactly. 
So please come and join us. It's fun. In addition, our site also has articles about our adventures in reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crag. And yeah, I'm I'm all furious. It's true. I actually just rearranged my bookcase and I want everyone to know that I made the conscientious decision to put my chartreuse on the bottom shelf. I know what you're saying to yourself. Nobody put chartreuse in the corner. Afraid it was done. Why does it make any sense? Why would you do that? Oh, you can't even point to it and say, get you some chartreuse. Get you some chartreuse. No, that doesn't prompt- work. You need and then re- promptly put it in the corner. No, where no one you know, you need to reorganize it. your bookshelves again. Y'all, it's like the beacon of Gondor on that bottom shelf. I installed something that has an LED light on the second shelf, and you can still see chartreuse. But we can't Final see it. Problem. I'm going to put chartreuse back up top. Yeah. We can't see it. That's all that matters. We can't see it. I'm going to like frame it and just hold it up every night. In there you go. <laughs> Get you some chartreuse that will match Carrie's nails. Hey, yeah. Put your hands up. Get you some chartreuse. Yeah. Get you some chartreuse. I actually kind of match my cup. <laughs> you do, actually. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>